the end of 1 Thessalonians, and we'll be jumping back into 2 Thessalonians, not next week, but uh, when, when I get back from holiday. But uh, we're looking here from verses 25 uh, to 28, uh, Paul's final remarks. And uh, for many of us, we might think just skipping through this is just pleasantries, but really as just prayed that all scripture is God breathed and is profitable and uh, in fact in this section it's probably at this point that Paul has actually taken up the pen himself and signed off uh, this letter as he does in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3 verse 17 where he says that he picks up the pen by his own hand and final words are very important aren't they that especially when we hear those words, although Paul is not dying at this point, it's not a prison letter as such, it was written AD 51-52 from Corinth on his second missionary journey, and, uh, but we do know it was very volatile, his time in Corinth, and uh, as he was uh, sharing the word of God, he came under much hostility from those in Corinth and those from the synagogue in Corinth. Uh, and a way of seeing these words, these final words, of somebody who is leaving us, somebody who, maybe say somebody who dies, or who's dying, who's passing away, and we're at, their, we're at their bedside, and they're speaking their final words, we listen to them, and we seek to apply them, and uh, uh, to honour those words. And well, this is scripture, and it is God's word, and we should seek to apply all of God's word to us and scripture and we should seek to honour it and, and, and live by it and, and Paul is addressing the church and it's an affectionate ending to the letter he again writes brothers that are united in Christ together they're brothers and they're sisters in Christ it is a, it's an affectionate end but a very solemn matter and serious matter that he's right to he has requests he has a request and he has uh, free instructions for them The church, firstly, we can see the request that Paul makes. Brothers, pray for us. And so the request we see is that Paul seeks to desire the Thessalonian church to pray for him. Just as he prayed for them. We know he was heartily praying for all the churches. You can read right through the epistles and the letters to Paul. You see again and again and again, he's praying for them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 2 We give thanks to God always for all of you constantly mentioning you in our prayers and so now he's asking prayer to be reciprocated brothers pray for us the apostle Paul was a theologian church planter par excellence he was a forerunner in church planter as a missionary, he travelled thousands of miles over land and sea, from Asia uh, to Europe. He was indeed the Bear Grylls of Christendom. He was a real survivalist. He went into the harshest of terrains, confronting enemies of the gospel. He sought to reach the lost. The apostle was a man who suffered and was persecuted. Here was a man who made disciples, who planted churches and served the church. The Apostle Paul went where others feared to tread. What made all this possible? Well, when that calling that he was set apart for made it all possible. Indeed, when the Lord said to Ananias in Acts chapter 9 verse 15, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. He was set apart for this task. Does he need prayer? As a one-time Pharisee, maybe not. But now as a humble servant of the Lord, he values the effectual prayers of his brothers and sisters in the church. Hence, uh, the request that he 
puts upon the church of Thessalonica. Brothers, pray for us, not just for himself, but for his co-workers too, who are working alongside him. Paul recognised his own weaknesses. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29, Who is weak that I am not weak? And that statement is found in the context of suffering and hardship and trials and difficulties that he had to face, verses 24 to 29. And at the time of writing this letter, he is indeed facing hardship and difficulties within Corinth. In Acts 18, you can see that quite clearly. Verse 6, he was opposed and reviled in a synagogue. They rejected his message. There was those who had received it. But there was a concerted attack against him in Corinth for 18 months. They brought him before the tribunal. And, and, and uh, I think it's Galileo. Or not, I can't see Galileo. Somebody like that was the, was the pro-council. And this confirms with the historical records of that time, around 51, 52 AD. And he was suffering. And he valued the prayer. He knew that prayer was going to help him. But the corporate prayer of the church. We see that was one of the like five foundational pillars, structures of, of the early church. In Acts 2.42 it tells us that they devoted themselves to prayer. They devoted themselves to the apostle doctrine, to the breaking of bread, to the fellowship and to mission. They devoted themselves to prayer. Preaching without prayer is dead. Fellowship without prayer is dead. Without prayer, nothing is done. It must be bathed in prayer. They devoted themselves to this prayer. And we can see it in action, can't we, in Acts. Just turn to, with me to Acts uh, chapter 12. You have a Bible. Acts chapter 12. It says, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John with the sword, martyred. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. And we know what happens, don't we? He was released. And he comes back to the house of Mary, to that prayer meeting. And they're praying. And they're astonished that, lo and behold, Peter drives in. The power of prayer. To bring deliverance and transformation and salvation. The power of prayer. It was earnest prayer. It was fervent. It wasn't just going through the motions. It was real. It was, knuckle, it was like a knuckle-ride prayer. It was earnest and it was effectual. That means it did what it said on the tin. It took place. It happened. Simply put, Paul believes that prayer works. In Philippians, his prison letter, he was in prison in Rome. And we don't know whether... He was released or that he was taken. And that was his ultimate deliverance. But to live is Christ and to, to die is gain. But in Philippians 1.19 he writes, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And so he solicits the prayers of the brothers. And these requests that Paul makes are found again and again and again in the letters to the churches. As he prays for them, he desires that they pray for him. And that we pray for one another. That we're bound in prayer. We're bound together in prayer. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 1 we, we, we get a bit more meat on the bone of what sort of things that he has for in prayer. Chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1. 
Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honoured, as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not of all faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. So he's praying that the word to be honoured and spread, deliverance from evil. He prays for deliverance from unbelievers. And he also prays in other letters like Ephesians 6.19 and Colossians 4.3 that they will find an effectual and open door and be able to clearly proclaim the gospel as they ought. He's requesting for gospel prayers, for mission-minded, for Christ-centred and deliverance. And salvation. And you know those prayers, those Thessalonians, when they would have received this letter, they would have prayed for him in this manner, and the Lord answered. Because it tells us in Acts 18, verses 9 to 11, the Lord says to him, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking. And do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many people in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months. Those prayers went up to the Lord. The Lord answered those prayers. Missionary Eli Stanley is a Methodist 20th century missionary who went to India. He said, we ask. And God does the work. We ask, and God does the work. Or Evan Roberts, the Welsh revivalist, he says, Secret intercessions make it possible for public labours to do their work and win. They do as much for the Lord's cause, who intercedes like Moses on the mount, as they do who fight like Joshua in the thick of the battle. Prayer based on God's word is the only weapon man can use to touch the invisible foe. It's prayer. A church is marked by intercessory prayer. This is the vitally important for the corporate life of the church. It's incumbent upon us, brothers and sisters, to pray for one another and to pray for mission and to pray for those who solicit prayers specifically and ask for prayer. We should pray. Uh, Dr. A.C. Dixon writes, when we depend upon an organisation, we, organ we get what organisation can do, and that is something. When we depend upon our preaching, we get what our preaching can do, and that is something. When we depend upon money, we get what money can do, and that is something. When we depend upon education, we get what education can do, and that is something. But when we depend upon prayer, we get what God can do. And what all of us need is what God can do. And so let us truly let the corporate life of this church be marked by intercessory prayer. For it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. So let's see to it. Or like the prophet Samuel who said to the people of Israel, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. Let us pray. Whether that is praying for the sick and anointing them with oil, whether that's praying for the leaders and praying for one another in the church, whether that's on our doorstep or overseas, let us continue to pray. As he says here in that instruction, in verse, where is it? There, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Have an habitual pattern of prayer. I don't know if you like Oswald Chambers. I like Oswald Chambers on his devotional. He's, he's a very spiritual man. And he died prematurely in Egypt. He, he served amongst the soldiers in one of the wars that was going on there at the time. He said this, Prayer does not equip you for great work, for greater works. Prayer is the greater work. 
And so for that, as we think about prayer, we must encourage one another to get to this means of grace of prayer. And so at our monthly prayer breakfast, I encourage you, come to them and pray. Partake in uh, prayer when we, in our services, in our Bible studies, at our monthly communion prayer meeting. Pray for us, brothers and sisters, as we pray for you too. Let's pray for one another. And our great pattern, of course, of this praying and solicited prayer is Jesus himself, isn't it? Who in the Garden of Gethsemane solicited of his disciples, watch and pray. Keep watch and pray. He's asking for prayer. He's asking them to keep watch and pray for him as he's there agonising in the garden of all that he's got to face. All that is coming upon them. He also prayed, didn't he? He exhorted his disciples, pray unto the Lord of the harvest to send out harvesters into that harvest field. He prays in that great high, high priestly prayer for those to be shared, to share in the glory of the Father and the Son and the Spirit in glory itself, that he prays for his disciples, that they would be with him in that place and that those disciples who will believe through him, you and I, will be with him. He prays for us. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father, forever interceding. And what is our Lord Jesus Christ doing? He is praying. <laughs> he's praying. And even on the cross, even on the cross, he prayed out to his Father, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And that prayer was answered because the Apostle Paul himself was saved. The enemy of God. And we've been saved by that grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the effectual prayers of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the church is marked by intercessory prayer. Secondly, the church is marked by a mutual affection. Greet the brothers with a holy kiss. You might have noticed the last couple of days you've been scratching your heads. So Aubrey's been doing something a bit unusual. Been going around shaking my hand. <laughs> So it's only from this that I've been doing that, I'm afraid. Uh, forgive me, I, you know, if I don't keep it up or whatever, but I do believe that there should be, same here we see, a brotherly affection, that there is a Christian affection amongst Christians. Now, I'm not saying that we should all be uh, kissing uh, one another on the, on, on the cheek as such, but it is, it's a sign of affection. And that's something that they did in that culture. Just like the Yanks, you know, and my sister's from America, and every time I see her, she gives me a big hug, you know, it's like, you know, you get a hug. And um, that's what Yanks do, or you get the Orientals and that sort of or, 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 or you get the Italians, you know, I was watching this Mafia film last night, and, you know, it's a kiss on the cheeks, isn't it? Or just close by. But, but it's like a cultural thing and we Brits, we, you know, we shake up, shake each other's hands, you know. And, and that was a cultural thing, but it brought new meaning and new emphasis to, to, to Christians because we are bound, like the mafia, <laughs> not in a bad sense, but in a good sense, we are bound by the Lord Jesus Christ. We are united in him. We are brothers and sisters. There should be that mutual affection. And he says, also notice, greet all the brothers. Not just those you like. All the brothers. Be, show Christian affection to everybody. Break down those, you know, if you're holding grievances or, I don't know, if you, we, we we need to break everything down because we are in our Lord Jesus Christ and we need to greet each other. We need to have that affection. That's why, you know, the, the, the kiss of Judas was so hyenas, wasn't it? Because it was a sign of affection. But it was actually a betrayal. It, it was hypocritical. To greet one another. 
Now there were different ways that they would do it. To kiss one another as a greeting in the ancient world. To a superior one would kiss the hand maybe. Or the breast or the knee or the foot. To be a friend it would be on the cheek. A sign of goodwill and affection. But for us it has that deep meaning. Notice what is unique about it as well. It's a holy kiss. A holy kiss. It's pure, it's not, it's a holy and pure sign of affection. It's reflecting a pure gospel of moral purity as family members together. 1 Peter 5.14 calls it a kiss of love. Of the love of God which is expressed towards us in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's an expression of the love which has invaded our lives. And it's outwardly being expressed and shown towards others. Now, in the first and second century, it took place at times of coming together at worship and at the communion table and at baptism. From records of the second century, Justin Martyr, he writes, After thus we have baptised the one who has been convinced and has given his assent to our teaching, we bring him to the place where those who are called brothers are gathered, in order that we may offer hearty prayers in common for ourselves, for the baptised person, and for all others in every place, having ended the prayers, we salute one another with a holy kiss. Then bread and a cup containing wine mixed with water are presented to the one of the brothers who was presiding. But abuses arose in the second century. Clement of Alexandria complained, writing, Who make the churches resound with their kissing? And goes on to say, shameless use of a kiss occasions foul suspicions and evil reports. And so by the 4th century, in the Apostolic Constitutions, it was directed that men should kiss men and women should kiss women on the cheek. But eventually it had stopped altogether. Should we be greeting one another? Of course we should. I think we should be shaking hands, I don't think we should be kissing one another because it's not culturally what, what we would do anyway as Brits. But I definitely, we, sh we, we should definitely be greeting one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord, in our shared faith together, in our common faith that we share, in our love in our Lord Jesus Christ. And let's not be selective in it. Let's not be aloof. Let's not have in the age of our personal relationship with Jesus, let's remember that we are a corporate body of brothers and sisters together. And we are united as one body. Thirdly, we see the church is marked by the public reading of Scripture. It says, I put you under oath, I before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. Here we have this solemn charge. It's not simply a request, but an instruction which is bound by an oath it, before the law to have this letter publicly read out. Of course, this is one of the earliest letters, as I've already said, 51, 52 AD, and it was to be read out to all the church, probably at the church meeting. Maybe there were those who were uh, seeking uh, to avoid being present. Or there was those who needed to hear, like the idol. But he wanted it to be read out to all. To all the brothers. This is a pastoral letter. And it's to establish them, as we have seen, in, in the faith. To, to have a life pleasing to God and understand uh, doctrinal issues on the second coming. And it was to be when they were gathered. And we know from records that these letters were written and read out at the same time as the Old Testament scriptures. And maybe the reason why it's so important that Paul specifies it here, being one of the earliest letters, he's wanting it to be identified alongside the Old Testament scriptures as scriptures themselves in their own uh, right. To to begin to start a precedence of reading the apostolic letters which were circulating around the churches. This would have been one of the earliest. And so it's an apostolic charge. And we know that when this word of God is read, that it is transformative. 
Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. This is the means whereby they are built up. And this is God's breathed out word that we believe. With all the authority, inspired and all sufficient. And so it is important that this letter is written out. And it's unauthenticating it as well, isn't it? That it is God's word. It was important that these letters weren't made up. They weren't imaginations of the men's thinking. As Peter says in 2 Peter, chapter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 to 21. It wasn't come out of one's own imagination. It wasn't thought up, but God inspired it through men as they spoke and as they wrote down. And then also... In 2 Peter, Paul authenticates, doesn't he, the Apostle Paul's letters as Scripture. Uh, Peter does, 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16. And so they have the equal weight as the whole of Scriptures. And it's another reason. So they're establishing this pattern for the church to do this. And we know that this is how the Scriptures... Uh, were formulated in the New Testament. That those apostolic letters which were written were circulating the churches in the early 2nd century and the 1st century. They were circulating the churches and they were the ones which were recognised as scripture and authenticated. And in the 4th century they were later authenticated as Gnostic writings came in and Gospels which were which were set aside but the scriptures were there circulating the churches at the birth of the church we see that in Acts 2.42 they says that the church devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, this probably wasn't the written word at that time, it was probably oral for the apostles were actually there present in Jerusalem with them as they were taught about Jesus, as they were taught the scriptures, this would have been orally taught. But as the persecution came, as the church spread out, and there was need for it to be written, and the need for the scriptures and teaching to be passed on to the churches, as God led these men to write down the scriptures, as God breathed out his word through them, using their faculties and their experiences. They wrote it down. And this is another way of important of it being read, is that we pre it's preserved. So the scriptures are preserved. That we have them in our own language today. Praise God that God led men to do this. And throughout the centuries, that the scriptures have been preserved in this manner. And may they continue uh, to be preserved. So these scriptures would have been read, and it's God's word, and it's vitally important that the scriptures are read. And that, you might see, well, that's obvious, Aubrey, but no, it's not obvious. You know, there are churches that do not read the scriptures as such. They do not expand the scriptures. They do not explain the scriptures, put the scriptures in their context, in their background, and teach them and apply them. And so it's important uh, to have the scriptures read in their meetings. And then finally, the church is marked by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's closing uh, benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And it's a gracious benediction. Uh, grace is God's unmerited favour. God's riches at Christ's expense. And the church is a church if it's marked by prayer, it's marked by Christian affection, it's marked by the scriptures, it's marked by grace. The church is a community of grace. It's not a, it's not a club, is it? We're all people who have been saved by grace. That's what sets us apart, the grace of God. And what can we say about this grace? Indeed, as John Newton wrote, it is an amazing grace. <laughs> that saves a wretch like me? But is it also an irresistible grace?
that comes to us, isn't it? And it came to the Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 4. It was irresistible. For he tells us there, as the gospel came to them, he says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came not to you, not only in word, but us in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. Paul knew that this was an irresistible grace, that it had come from God, that it came from a God, and they could not refuse it. It's irresistible. It's not even looking one of those cakes. Kerry, you know, I had a comb, a comb and uh, it had cream in it and jam in it and sugar, Danielle brought them for me. I had two, all to myself. It was irresistible. <laughs> I had to have them. Well, it's an irresistible grace and it's from God. We cannot refuse God. If God has chosen us, he will save us. No human power can stop it. It's irresistible. And that was marked as something which happened to them in the past. It was an irresistible grace. And what does it tell us? The Lord Jesus himself is that grace. Titus 2.11 For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. They have turned from God to idols because of the irresistible grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of our God. Not only was it irresistible, this grace, it was immeasurable. It was immeasurable. It continued to transform their lives. It was grace upon grace. When they sinned, grace abounded all the more. Grace abounds to us, John 1.16. Or 1.6, for, for from him, his fullness, we have received grace upon grace. It's an immeasurable grace. It's an irresistible grace. It is an irrevocable grace. It's irrevocable because those whom he foreknew, he has predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, and those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. He has not only saved us, he has not only kept us, he will glorify us. And it is all of his amazing grace to us. Ephesians 2, 6 says, Raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Yes, he has already raised us up. But in the coming ages... He might show us that immeasurable riches of his grace. It's irrevocable. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We shall be there in glory, all because of his amazing grace. And so, in a way, it's a past grace, a present grace, and a future grace too. And so here we have more than a hearty goodbye. <laughs> he wants them to be filled with a life of grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, infused in their lives. And so this highlights how different our lives really should be. Even in the everyday, may we be a church marked by prayer, by Christian affection, by the reading, the public reading of the scriptures, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each of us. Maybe we say the grace uh, together to one another. Now maybe.